Three, two. Hello, Tom Lavecki here with a very, very special edition of the New Theory Podcast. Today, we got a very special guest, Jared Ferrara, my favorite actor and entourage of many other his great uh, shows and and, uh, and podcasts. But now he's launching a new podcast called Throwbacks, launching September 5th on the podcast station or whatever platform you choose. Jerry Farr, welcome to the New Theory Podcast. How are you doing today, buddy? I'm doing good. Thanks for having me. And uh, that was a great introduction. I appreciate it. It's my pleasure. I, 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 it's funny because I've been wanting to have you on for a long time. We had this opportunity, so I'm going to jump right in. Cool. So, Jerry, you, you know, you had a diverse career in both television, you know, and film. How was your role uh, as Turtle and Entourage shape your career? You know, what did you learn from it, and how are you going to kind of roll that into your experience for Throwbacks? It's funny because you know, it, it happened kind of quick for me getting Entourage, but in my eyes, it was taking so long. You know, I started acting around like 17 years old uh, cool. in New York, doing plays and stuff and extra work. Moved to LA when I was 20. And by 23, I was on Entourage. So I, in my eyes, that took a long time. A lot of people <laughs> tell me I truly don't know how lucky I am. And I do know yeah. I'm lucky. Uh, and that was a blessing. I mean, look, I, it changed my whole life. You know, yeah. it changed my family's life. And I thought I knew, not even that I knew a lot about acting. I thought I was a good actor at that yeah. point. But I realized quickly once that show started, I have a lot to learn just about what it means to be day in, day out, Monday through Friday. This is what you do 12, 15 hours a day and all the other ancillary things that come with it and making sure you stay out of trouble so you don't mess up the opportunity you're in. You know, I, I learned a lot about a lot uh, when yeah. that show started. And I thought I knew everything like a typical young person, but uh, I had well, a lot. I had, to... a, I had a Joe Perino on who's in power also. Yeah, and, yeah. And I had him on a while back and he talked about what kind of jammed him up was he had very early success. Sure, sleepers, I yeah. I the second and third round. They're like, wow, it's not that easy. But you stayed level-headed and uh, I'm happy for that. So you transitioned from acting to being a sports commentator. How did you love for like sports influence that shift? And how do you balance those two passions? So look, I, my little secret that I've been doing as my side hustle, I always try to figure out a way I take th things that I love to do in my spare time and try and yeah. make them into like jobs. You yeah, know, I did right. it with gaming, you know, and yeah. I was streaming and I helped run the Knicks 2K League team. And similarly with sports, I'm a sports fanatic. I watch yeah. it and to a point where my wife probably says I watch too much, but now it's, it's work. It's a job, right? So that's how I kind of conquered it. And, you know, Entourage has given me a lot, but one of the things it also gave me was, you know, I had the chance to go on ESPN and first take and guest host for a lot. Of, I mean, I think before acting, my first real dream was I wanted to be like a, a sport, like a broadcaster. I wanted to call games. You know, I think that was my first real dream that I'm sort of trying to live out now. Nice. And then a throwback. So it's going to help accomplish that. Can you share it? I have to ask, can you share a memorable story or behind the scenes moment from Montage that might surprise fans? <sighs> you know, there's so many. It's funny because like we just had the 20 year anniversary yeah. and a lot of clips were posted from the show. But when I see those clips, I really think of like the behind the scenes. Here, here's a cool behind the scenes story. So they had asked us, uh, this is around season three, to uh, be on the cover of Entertainment Weekly, which, uh, you know, magazines back then being on the cover. I mean, even still now, it was a huge deal. It was the first cover anyone asked us to do. And we were going to shoot the cover because we were shooting the show on a Saturday because Monday through Friday we were working. That Friday, when while filming, we were doing this scene where there was a basketball hoop. Kevin Dillon, who plays drama, was like shooting around or whatever. And in between takes, we were all really playing. And Kevin Dillon and Adrian were playing and their feet got caught up. And Kevin Dillon fell all his weight on his hand and like broke his wrist in four places I, and had to have like, we had to shut down, had to have emergency surgery. And then Entertainment Weekly is like, sorry, we, we'll, we'll get you. We'll do a cover. We'll do it down the road, but we have to shoot something. Kevin Dillon, true Iron Man, not more than eight hours removed from surgery, showed up on the set and we have this great spread in entertainment weekly and if you look at the photos i'm in front of his arm in every single photo and yeah. there's a few scenes if you look at in season three where he's using his hand it looks like a wooden hand his yeah. hand was so swollen so like that's something i look at when i see that scene i'm like oh yeah kevin dylan broke his wrist an hour after shooting that that's uh that's that I, that that's awesome yeah well, well not for kevin at the time no but, but just yeah retro of course of course 
So what was it like working with like legends like Michael Douglas, De Niro, in the, was it Las Vegas? And yeah. then had a standout moment there. Cause I would totally geek out, but that that was crazy. You know, I really wanted that that movie. It was a really cool part, and all my stuff was with those guys. You know, it was kind of like this senior citizen hangover. And I, you know, I auditioned for it a bunch of times. And then when I got it, obviously I was nervous going to work that first day. Like my first scenes were with like Michael Douglas and, yeah. and De Niro. And I think those guys know at that time, I think I was probably like 30 years old. I think they just know a uh, 30 year old kid from New York. Yeah. He probably worships us. So they yeah. just kind of brought me in right away and started asking me a bunch of questions about myself. And wow. next thing you know, you're like, Hey, Mikey, Bobby, good scene. today. <laughs> Way to go. You know, it, it was, uh, yeah, it was another surreal moment where I feel like my career has been a, like a joke that someone's playing on me. I love it. In Lone Survivor, you worked with again, another great cast. You hooked back up with Mark Wahlberg, Taylor Kish. How, how did the uh, intense nature of that film you know, impact the camaraderie amongst the cast and, and, and help you in your career. So what's crazy that you said, think, you know, Las Vegas first is I, you know, and I didn't have a very big part in Lone Survivor, but I had a very, I think, important part. I'm on the phone with Taylor Kitsch's character, Mike Murphy, while he's committing the heroic act and yeah. losing his life as well. Yeah. Uh, so I was shooting Las Vegas at the same time. So I'd be in Vegas shooting this like comedy with these legends. Everything is about the joke. And then I I wrap that and I fly to New Mexico where they're shooting Lone Survivor where Peter Berger is a good friend of mine and everyone's in beards and the tone is really dark. No one's telling jokes. Yeah. So I'd come in with all this energy and I had to learn to, all right, got to tone it back down. So then I'd leave New Mexico and go back to Vegas where I'm supposed to be and I'd be all <laughs> intense and they're like telling me more energy. So uh, it, yeah, it was a really wild time doing those at the same time. And Lone Survivor is one that comes up a lot with people. I think people really hold that movie in serious high regard. It's nice. a good one. Nice. You touched on it earlier that you're a diehard sports fan. You're known as being a, a, a diehard Knicks fan. Um, how do you think your sports fandom influenced your work, like from maybe um, subconsciously or consciously? How did it help kind of influence your work both on and off the screen? Yeah, it's you know what? To me, sports... I know a lot of people say sports is entertainment. I don't think it's entertainment for the players because, you know, they're risking injuries and stuff. Yeah. It, for me, it's part of culture. So I was lucky enough to, even with Entourage, it just so happened that Doug Allen, our showrunner, yeah. was a big sports fan, Steve Levinson as well, Wahlberg as well. So sports was a big part of the of Entourage as well. Yeah. So it was just a natural crossover for me. And for whatever reason, Tom, I, I, I don't... I, I, I'm actually going to start asking some athletes this when we talk to them on the podcast. Like, yeah. of course, actors enjoyed the the show. Maybe it was a little too close to home, but athletes really took to Entourage. The, yeah. the most set visitors we ever had while we were shooting wasn't like, oh, uh, Tom Hardy's here visiting. Yeah, no, yeah. it was like uh, Kevin Durant's here today. Or <laughs> Steph Curry's here today. Yeah. And, you know, so... You know, I get it from my mom. My mom's a big sports fan, and I, I think it's actually helped my acting career in nice. in, a, in a weird way, like understanding the moment. Nice. I mean, I, this is probably by design, but whenever you would meet like another A lister on the show, they always knew who Turtle was. I mean, LeBron knew who you were. Um, like pretty much anybody. <laughs> and then you're kind of sitting there. You're like, well, wait a second. Like Turtle's really intertwined <laughs> with this with this crew. So I always thought that was kind of cool. So it was I'm, a little inside joke. Like there was one, I think Kanye and Turtle knew each other. I think the Ari character says, Turtle, introduce me to Kanye. It's like, <laughs> how does he know these people? He's the guy to talk to. I love it. So, you know, you, you know, you say your life, you know, life is a movie and, and, and you're doing great, but you got some pretty you know, good and big roles. How did you choose which roles to take that, you know, that you were offered? What was your criteria and what was important to you to, because you know, obviously, listen, at the end of the day, you have to accept these roles. So what was important to you when accepting these roles? So here's how it's worked with my career. Once I really started working, you know, yeah. uh, look, any decisions on like, am I going to do it? Am I not going to do it? Was always a, is the character good, right? Like, is there a oh. moment to play or moments to play? Yeah. And then I always just said like, do I, would I want to see this movie, yeah. you know, or this show? Would I watch it? That's, That's another big point. thing. 
But I'll tell you, to be honest, Tom, as as lucky as I have been, all the good stuff I still have to fight for, right? Like, I'm not trying to yeah. say I was never been offered anything good. I have, you know, yeah. quite often. But if it's something that came along, like, you know, like Lone Survivor, that wasn't just like Pete Berg saying like, hey, you want this cool part? Oops, sorry. He, no. um, you know, it, it took a while. So I always felt like, too, if there was resistance. Yeah. For the idea of me, that means it's probably something I should go after because it's probably really good. I love it. Out of all the questions, this is probably the one I'm really interested in, in learning. Do you have any interesting rituals or superstitions when it comes to watching the Knicks and your other favorite teams? God, I should get my wife down here to talk to you about this one because specifically, I'm probably most crazy about the Knicks. I mean, I'm crazy about it all, but the Knicks, because they've been such a, a kind of tortured franchise in a lot of ways in the fans. I, I'm, I like to watch alone. Uh, yeah. Uh, not like if it's like this, but like, if it's a big game, like yeah. I need to like all the playoff run, they were just on. I'm like on the couch. Wow, really? If, wow. I'm superstitious. Like if I have, like I, I wear a hat that I'm, I have to sit in the same spot. I do the same things. I am very, very superstitious when it comes to watching the Knicks. It's actually something that Matt, my, Matt Liner, my co-host yeah. and I, because Matt says like, obviously Matt's a big sports fan, but yeah. he's also a professional athlete. So yeah. like, I don't feel any certain way about one team like you do about the Knicks, right? Like I have, I'm a fan of like the Dodgers, but he's, we watched the game together, a Knicks game, a playoff game. And he saw me in my, my glory and torture. And he's like, he just was entertained by watching me watch the game. Well, one of the cool things about throwbacks is going to be you get to obviously talk about sports and stuff, but you got to kind of give it two different angles. You have an accomplished actor, but it, but a kind of like respectfully a regular New York guy on top of it, which is cool. Also, I like. And then you have like Matt Liner, who, who Heisman Trophy winner. So we're going to see it. So from like different perspectives. So like, give us a little bit of preview on. You butt heads? Are you aligned? I mean, it's good. This is good. You know, what is it? A USC? I think he was he, USC, cool. and you know, you USC at a time he won the Heisman yeah. pretty much when I started Entourage. So uh, we were. I'm a little bit older than him, but you know, we were both in LA at the same. We didn't know each other back then. We could have easily been great friends back then. Yeah. It's funny though, you know, making friends now. Like I said, it's a lot harder, and he's becoming my really, really good friend through this podcast. And yeah, like, look, I ask him a lot of stuff. Like, I'm, I'm so curious about the things that no one asks athletes. Like, all right, what are you watching on the plane? These guys fly all the time, yeah. right? What are you packing? What yeah. do you bring? Do you leave the hotel a lot? What are you doing? Yeah. For, if I had to travel 30 weeks a year, I'm on a plane twice a week. I, I'd have a, I have a million questions, but I'd be panicked yeah. for my schedule. So yeah. like, that's the point of view. I come, we're not just doing like X's and O's stuff. It's yeah. It's a lot, and also like, you know, we have kids the same age and we're both pretty big family guys. So, awesome. and pop culture, he's very, really interested in film and TV. So. Oh, wow. So it'd be some crossover. So I, I love, you know, I've been always following your career. I was a big power guy. Uh, can you share maybe a funnier, funnier, unexpected story from power? I know you hooked back up with Dom Lombardozzi there. Yeah. Uh, Dom's a good guy. Actually, he follows me. So he may see this. Uh, so give us maybe something on power that uh, a lot of people don't know about. Well, I will say power was cool for me because when I first started acting, I really thought of myself more dramatically. Well, here's a story I'll share, right? So yeah. you do entourage all these years and then you want to go do dramas and everyone is kind of like, oh, well, he's like the entourage guy. Like he's comedic. Can he do yeah. drama? And here, Courtney Kemp, the creator of yeah. power, uh, yeah. writer, producer, creator, you know, I met with her for a different role, didn't work out. And she had said to me, which Tom, I've heard this 35 times in my career. She said, um, you know, I'm going to write something for you. I think that you could do really good in the drama. So yeah. when I call you, just be ready. I'm like, sure. Sounds yeah. wonderful. <laughs> I look forward to never hearing from you again. Sure enough, a year later, she called me with the role of Proctor and not only the role of Proctor laid out like the seasons, like, Wow. By season four, Ghost is going to be in jail and you're going to be trying to get him out. Like she had it all, man. And uh, um, and then so I go do power for six years, yeah. which is a New York drama. And then I get off that and I'm going after a, com a comedic movie. And they're like, oh, can you do comedy? 
<laughs> he was just on the drama for six years. Can, well, you, you, know, can you do comedy? I'm like, well, you yes. Because we're you know we're around the same age, so there's almost like different kind of Jerry Ferraris. Like obviously for me, you're going to be you know turtle for a minute and 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 can kind of graduate to power. But there's people that are younger that know who you are who don't even like my. I married a little younger. My wife's 28. She doesn't even know what entourage is. <laughs> yeah. Tom, listen, I walk the streets of Brooklyn sometimes oh, and man. I'll be on one, I'll be in one street and it's like, uh, hey, it's turtle. Oh my God. You know, it's a bunch of 35 to 50 year old dudes. Yeah. Right. And then I cross the street and then it's usually a lot younger people coming up to me. It's like Proctor from Pat and they don't know entourage. The entourage yeah. They don't know power. Like, Funny. It's almost like being typecast twice, yeah. Yeah. but which shouldn't happen because that defeats the whole theory of yeah, typecast, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's been a wild ride. Well, you um, and this may be that by design, Jared, and it's a positive thing. You were never super like the soprano Italian mobster guy, or like you're at the you know whatever con, and you're kind of living off the past. You kind of navigated always, kind of one step ahead of the curve. Was that well, what what part of that is design? What's luck? What skill? What's not like? Because I, I don't have you. Like I'm not calling you up saying, "Hey, come to the whatever con in New York and you're signing signatures all day." Your career is still peaking. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, I, I think it's all the things you just said, right? Like I can't claim it's all by design because I'm not yeah. that smart. But yeah. <laughs> you know, podcasting, for example, which is some of what we talked about today. I, my wife and I, she wasn't my wife at the time. We started ours back in 2012, right? It's no longer in existence. Once we start, once we start having kids, yeah. she no longer will talk in front of a microphone <laughs> ever again, probably. But we had it for six, seven years. It was very yeah. successful. Yeah. That was part my hobby, but also part like this is kind of where it's all going. So reading the tea leaves. Similarly cool. with gaming yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, with gaming, knowing like live streaming. So that is, I guess, the skill by design part. And also getting myself into really good shape, which was also yeah. A for my own health, because I was really not healthy. And B, look, what's the biggest way to change people's perception of you if they think you're one thing? maybe yeah. look a little different. Right. So partly by design, but the, the luck of it all was that, you know, I guess just, I, I don't know, maybe it wasn't luck, but you know, the fact that gaming would become so popular and podcasts would become so, so popular worked in my favor yeah. for sure. But also I don't know if a lot of people who in my position at the time would have did power when I did. What I mean by that is, the first role I went to talk to Courtney about was a smaller role. Interesting. And then when she, when she pitched me Proctor and all that, but like at the time power hadn't blown up yet. It yeah. was on stars, which not a lot of people yep. were jumping to be on stars at the time, Yep. you know, and I, and it wasn't, I could tell you now it was not a lot of money. So I was, it wasn't a financial decision at all. And it was in New York. It wasn't even like in my own backyard. I was living sure. in LA, <laughs> but it was like, Hey, it's a good, it's a good part. And yeah. I still was on, we were doing the Entourage movie at the time. So it wasn't like I yeah. had to do it. I was getting paid very well to do the Entourage movie and stay in LA. But I'd get on the plane. i go shoot a day and a half in New York yep. in the dead of winter and come back to LA. And I think that's part of it, you know? And also I tried my best to never screw anybody over and be like, you know, a nice, a nice normal guy. I love it. Uh, I've got a few more questions before I wrap up. How important... Is your background being an Italian American? I have a certain affinity for you as an Italian fellow Italian American. How important, you know, is it being an Italian American actor, and how does that help you along the way, or or not sometimes? And you know, in LA, I know there's like kind of like a lot of people from New York and a lot of Italians that way now, yeah. if you will. How has that kind of helped shape your career as Italian American? Well, first of all, I, I am very very proud i feel like there's a a long list of very prominent italian american actors i don't put myself on that list but you know it does I do. well you know de niro pesci yeah, yeah. like it's yeah. a it's a long list um yeah. i i definitely feel a certain pride but it's oddly enough like you said though i'm never considered for like the gangster mob yeah. roles i just ne i've i've went out for a bunch of them maybe it's because i'm a shorter guy. I'm not physically imposing, although Joe Pesci was arguably the most threatening <laughs> gangster character of all time. Yep. And I think I'm way bigger than him. Yep. But, uh, and you mentioned Dom Lombardozzi. He yeah. gets them all. If anything, yeah. 
And Dom is not like that at all. Dom is like a big teddy bear with also many layers. So, but I, I feel a great pride, man. I grew up the way I grew up in Brooklyn. It was not a popular choice to become an actor. Yeah, there was not yeah. a lot of actors where I where I come from. But I think I definitely got a, a street smarts of how to. Courtney Kemp calls it like verbal judo, right? Like how yeah. to kind of just like how to talk to people, how to conduct yourself. I, I I give a lot of any success I've had to my upbringing, a lot of it. That's awesome. And, and and throwbacks, you talked a little bit about there's gonna be a dad vibe to it. I'm oh, definitely, for sure. Definitely gonna be listening for that reason. How has your perspective on sports changed since becoming a father? And how do you share that passion with your family? Yeah, well, it's funny. I have lost a couple of but like I used to watch everything. I no longer could watch everything because of I have young kids. Yeah. They're starting to play sports. Let's say my my co-host Liner, he's got an older son, 18. So they're very much in the sports. Oh, wow. yeah. And his younger kids are starting. Yeah. Mine are kind of starting. Uh look. <laughs> I, it's funny. You know what's actually interesting? Every night before I would put the kids to sleep, my older son, my five-year-old, who's playing the drums, I think I just heard right now. So good yeah, thing we're rapping soon. Awesome. Yeah. You know, we we'll li we listen to podcasts. The one we love is like, who's smarted? It's made for kids. It's like yeah. educational. And he sees me do the show sometimes from home or he comes with me to LA. And now at night, he makes me voice note him and we record, he records a podcast. He literally says, like, and subscribe. Yeah. He, he knows all the, the things to say. So I'm like, all right, he doesn't know me as an actor yet because he can't watch anything I've been in, but he knows me as this right now. That's pretty cool. That's awesome. So before we wrap up, you're in New York for 24 hours. You have time to grab one slice of pizza and one one restaurant sit down dinner. Which two are they? Pizza and restaurant. <sighs> pizza for sure. I'm going back into Gravesend, Brooklyn, sort of my neighborhood. Uh, Spumoni Gardens, L and B oh, nice. oh, pizza. Yeah, yeah. yeah I mean. Out. That's nice. where we went every Sunday yeah, as a kid. Yeah, yeah. Nice. And look, this is a corny answer. I don't have the restaurant. I'm going to my mom's kitchen. Uh, my God. mom has the best meatball. I know every Italian kid says their mom's got the best meatballs. Yeah. My mom really has the best meatballs of all time. Awesome. That is awesome. Well, listen, check out Throwback, September 5th, the launches. Jerry Farr, Matt Liner, wherever you find your podcast. Jerry, I'll give you the final word before we wrap up. No, I just want to thank you, man. You you know, you said a lot of nice things to me that I feel like you meant. And I like that you put me on the Italian American actors list. That means a lot. Uh, uh, just thank you for taking the time. I enjoyed this conversation. It's my pleasure. We'll be in touch. And thanks again, man. Take care, Tom. All right.